All right, um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, what I hope will be a fun and fascinating session. Uh, short, brief, action-packed. Um, what we're going to try to do is to talk about something very simple. Um, what is happening in, a, in, in the societies of the West, the, particularly in the polities of the West? Uh, why did Trump win? Uh, to what extent is this a larger phenomenon of a kind of populist wave that is sweeping the Western world? Uh, all that in 45 minutes and you get a bit of a movie to, to, to go with it. So we'll start with the, with the movie. Uh, this is a CNN documentary that, uh, that I did that has aired in the United States and, and abroad uh, about a few months ago. Uh, the WEF liked it and asked me if we'd construct a little panel around it. I thought of the two smartest people I could get to do it uh, with me, and that's Zanny Minton Beddoes, the editor-in-chief of The Economist, and George Osborne, the former chancellor of the Exchequer, and currently the editor of The Evening Standard, which George pointed out to me has a circulation of more than The Times, the FT, and the and the Guardian put together. So, um, you know, it, it reminds one of the old days of, uh, of Beaverbrook and, and uh, Fleet Street. Um, I, what I thought I'd do is uh, get out of the way and let, let, let you watch the movie to start, and then we'll, we'll talk about it more. My favorite class at college was called Thursday Afternoon at the Movies. It was actually a course called The History of American Cinema, and the great thing about it was you could watch movies in the afternoon and doze off. I, that's why we schedule it in the morning, so no dozing. Can we start? Are we going to win Ohio? We are. He's doing something the establishment doesn't like. It's the establishment that's the problem. This is ground zero. We are so off message. Ohio loves you! You know how off message we are? A guy that shits in gold-plated toilets is talking to blue-collar workers, and we're not. David Beatford, the chairman of the Democratic Party in Mahoney County, couldn't believe his eyes. A massive Republican turnout tonight in Mahoney County. In the March primary, thousands of Democrats left the party just to vote for Trump. The News Radio 570 WKVN. And I am taking a Republican ballot. I'm supporting Trump. They are relating to a billionaire. Voting for Trump from day one. I have been for Donald Trump. You excited a base of people the same way Obama did, you know, eight years prior. You brought out people that had never voted before. This is where Donald Trump has tried to sell, hey, the factory's closed. Hey, I'll rip up NAFTA. In November, the results were stunning. In Mahoning County, compared to 2012, there was a 12-point swing toward Trump. In Trumbull County, the swing was 13 points, and Trump scored a win. Thank you, Ohio. I love you. Thank you. A man that shits in gold. What in the world is he saying? It, I, I mean, I want to laugh and cry at the same time. So how did it happen? How did Clinton lose the presidency? And how did so few people see what was coming? Well, this man saw it very clearly. We started talking to people, and I said, we got to warn them that they're messing this up. They're f***ing it up. Everyone David Beatrice was the canary in the coal mine. I said, boy, she's in trouble. So my consultant and I wrote a memo. That memo, written six months before the election, went up Beatrice's chain of command, warning that the campaign was losing Ohio voters who had once been devoted Democrats. Had they listened to this memo, we would be talking to President Hillary Clinton I was having a lot of people just saying, I can't support her. And, you know, this guy wants to bring back our jobs. They didn't care about all of his misogynistic, xenophobic, racist stuff. They just didn't care. All they heard was jobs, 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 and he's going to try to get them jobs. We're going to bring back jobs because we need jobs here. We're going to bring jobs back from China. To Pennsylvania. To Michigan. And all across this land, we're going to bring our jobs back. And, and he sold them that. And we weren't giving them sustenance. Beatrice says his Democrats never understood exactly what Hillary Clinton was for. They are working class people who think the Democratic Party has left them. And of course, we know those white working class voters were the tipping point. 
To understand just how big a deal this is, let's go back a bit, back to the 1970s. We've never forgotten that the Democratic Party is well named. It's a party of the people. Jimmy Carter was for certain a man of the people, a peanut farmer from Plains, Georgia. Their brand image is the party of the people, the party of working people specifically. It started even earlier, actually, with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It was mostly the white working class that put him in the Oval Office four times. The author and scholar Thomas Frank. This is who they were as a party. Note Frank's use of the word were. All that changed, he says, with a Democrat who actually had a unique appeal to the white working class. In the name of the hardworking Americans who make up our forgotten middle class, I proudly accept your nomination for President of the United States. Bill Clinton is the sort of emblematic figure in the transition of the Democratic Party from a party uh, that, that cares about working class, middle class people to a party that is very much concerned with uh, you know, the innovation, economy, and uh, Wall Street and all that. Frank's right. The Democratic Party did change during Bill Clinton's presidency. Bill Clinton made the party a bigger tent. And into that big Democratic tent went the elites of America, its lawyers and doctors and stockbrokers. But let's remember, Clinton essentially tied his Republican opponents in the white working class demographic in both 1992 and 1996. So why did the white working class vote for Bill and not for Hillary? What they've become over the last couple of decades is a party of the professional class, this highly educated, affluent, white collar people, the sort of upper 10% of the income distribution. David Brooks says Hillary Clinton fits into this category perfectly went to a fancy school, went to an either fancy or law school, married a guy from a fancy law school, lives in the sorts of places where those people would gather, and they're the sort of zip codes with restoration hardware, an anthropology clothing store. If it sounds like he's simply describing rich people here, Brooks says there's a very important distinction between rich entrepreneurs, people who create companies and make things and employ people, and professionals. People in the working class or people who voted for Trump don't mind billionaires. What they mind are bossy professionals, teachers, lawyers, journalists, who seem to want to tell them what to do or seem to want to tell them how to act. And if you had to pick the classic epitome of that person who most offends them, that would be Hillary Clinton. You could put half of Trump's supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. And so she was exactly the wrong person. Maybe but she seemed to have the right ideas. At least she had ideas, actual policies, beyond banning Muslims or building border walls. She wanted to raise taxes on the wealthy. She had a plan for the opioid epidemic devastating the working class. She said she wanted to retrain workers. In fact, said Barack Obama, There has never been a man or a woman, not me, not Bill, nobody, more qualified than Hillary Clinton to serve as president of the United States of America. But it turns out voters often do not vote on policy. Instead, they choose the candidate they can relate to. If you ask people after an election which party stood for which policies, like a third of the people don't know. That's not what they're in the business of doing. But one thing we are all in the business of doing is judging people and judging social identity. Which party is filled with the sorts of people I hung out in high school with? And so it was the state of Ohio voted against Hillary Clinton. And it still upsets Petrus. I love my country, and I love my valley, and I love my state, and I didn't want this man to be president, and I did everything I could. And we, and we blew it, and I'm angry, and I'm upset. Um, George, Zanny, if you come up and uh, we can talk about this. Um, so as you can see with the, in the movie, one of the things we tried to do was to, was to highlight the degree to which there was a real economic issue that was driving, that was the undercurrent of this, this rise of populism and this populist candidate, but also non-economic issues.
So here we dwelt a little bit on social class. Um, there's also culture, the, 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 which we talk about in the documentary, the degree to which immigration uh, really unsettled an older white part of the population and made them feel that their country was changing. The, the single question that um, correlated most strongly with uh, Trump vote, uh, voting for Trump the, uh, was the, uh, the question, um, do you feel alienated in your own country? Or something like that. It may have been slightly different. And I noticed that in one of the uh, analyses of Brexit, that was all the survey question that was, again, the, the strongest predictor of a Brexit voter was something like that. I do, you know, you feel alienated or you feel like the culture is changing too rapidly. So George, when you, looked at the, when you look at this and you think about Brexit, how much do you think this kind of idea of capitalism plus culture plus class explains what happened with, in, in Brexit mm. and beyond in Europe as well? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was in Downing Street on the night of the <clears throat> Brexit referendum and you know, the results from areas that, you know, in Britain would be similar to uh, the counties you went to in Ohio came in for Brexit, uh, the northeast of England, sort of post-industrial towns. And it was the, actually the thriving metropolitan areas that voted to remain inside uh, the European Union. Not just London, but actually the centre of Manchester voted to remain inside the EU. Um, and <clears throat> so, you, you know, I, I've definitely detected, I, I was a, a Conservative politician for almost two decades, and I detected, you know, a shift essentially in British politics, which is similar to the shift you've seen in American politics, uh, away from economic issues, although I think economic grievance is a big motivating factor behind them, towards cultural issues. And you've seen a shift in the appeal of the different political forces in the UK, similar again to what you see in the US. So for example, right now, uh, one of the biggest indicators of whether you're a voter for the British Labour Party, although it's led by, you know, quite far left Marxists, is whether you have a college degree. And, uh, you know, there's a very large majority of college educated people who are voting for Labour, whereas people without college degrees who would previously have sort of naturally aligned themselves with the left wing working class party, if you like, uh, would say that they voted conservative now and so you are seeing quite a big shift in the matrix away from the kind of left right on the economic spectrum to a you know I guess a sort of I don't know how you put it but kind of globalized and non-globalized right, right. approach uh, on culture almost sort of open closed you want an <coughs> open, open society closed, yes. you want a closed society yeah. is any I mean if you were to pick do you think I, I I tend to agree with George that economics is the kind of underlying motive but for some reason the way people now experience politics uh, is much more through identity, cl class, culture. Those are the issues that seem to rub them. I, I think it's actually both of those. I think uh, I would start by saying that I think we all ought to uh, start looking at this with some humility. It's kind of ironic that it's two Remainer Brits talking about why Trump won in Davos <laughs> with you. Uh, so, you know, set that aside. I think it is uh, a combination of the economic and the cultural. And there are important differences on both sides of the Atlantic, but important themes that are similar. And the economic, you're right, it, it, we know we had a period, particularly after the financial crisis, of living standards being hit, but we've had a long period of relatively stagnant living standards for a large number of people. People who felt on both sides of the Atlantic for the first time that their children would be less well off than they were. So that economic insecurity, I think, fueled a sense of grievance against a system that produced an elite like the people here. And it was a sense that the system was stacked against ordinary people. I think coupled to that, uh, the cultural sense, as you say, that societies were changing remarkably quickly, you know, whether it was uh, through because of large-scale immigration, was it whether it was because of rapid progression on important social issues. Social issues I'm incredibly you know, glad have had progression, yeah. like gay rights. But for a lot of people, that meant society was changing very fast. And I think in both countries, different things were added to that. And so in the UK, for example, I think the sense that uh, ordinary people were feeling left behind was aggravated actually by the financial crisis and the austerity program afterward that came. There were people who felt that you know, they didn't see the public services they used to. They then thought that's because there were too many migrants from Europe, and that pushed the anti-Brexit or the pro-Brexit vote. And on both sides of the Atlantic, I think it's important, though, to remember that this sense of frustration and anger, while very real and important, wasn't the only thing that drove victory for Trump or the Brexit 
the, the leavers on the Brexit side. On both cases, whether it was you know, affluent, elderly, conservative Tories who voted to leave for reasons of sovereignty, or in the US, Republicans who stayed with the Republican Party even though Trump was the candidate. It was, and this is a phrase that has been said of Britain, but people say that Brexit was won by a coalition of blue collars and red trousers. And red trousers are typically worn by <laughs> the kind of people that George knows very well as <laughs> members of his party. <laughs> I've um, never worn red trousers. No, not in my you, life. but they are members of your party. Um, and I think the same thing in the US. It was a coalition of the disenchanted, angry people who felt left behind culturally right. and economically, right. actually, with a remarkable number of the elite still voting on traditional Republican lines. So, was it, you know, that's in, in part the puzzle. Was it, George, a, an alliance of people, of, of, you know, the red trouser mm. uh, crowd, because they shared some of those cultural. Uh, you know, reactions, or was it that they, you know, was it that people like Paul Ryan were cynically making a deal, saying, "Look, you can you can say all your your mm. racist nonsense as long as I get my tax cut." Well, I think again, uh, you know, speaking of Brexit, and of course, you know, the odd thing is the the government, the incumbent government, which I was part, had just won a general election, mm. so it was not as if, you know, there was a desire to kind of reject the government because we just had a test of that. Um, I think it, it was an alliance of, I guess, the sort of insulated and the insecure. Insulated because they were retired, often owned their own home outright without a mortgage, yeah. uh, and I maybe were um, um, anxious at the pace of social change. And then there were the insecure, the people who weren't in work or were in marginal employment, um, and looking for something uh, to you know, address their grievance or something to blame. I think, to be fair, you can't totally dismiss the actual substance of the issues in these. I, mean, I think there's a danger of people like myself to just say, well, Brexit you know, was just a, you know, an excuse for people to vote the way they did. You've got to accept in the Brexit referendum there were a large number of British people who were not convinced that we should be in the European right. Union, yeah. had real concerns about sovereignty and the like. And I think it's, there's a risk that you kind of reject those issues. Similarly, in the United States, where I would pick, uh, you know, fault if I dare with you, uh, read on your movie, is everyone here could tell you Donald Trump's policies, right? If I said to you, what were Donald Trump's policies, you would go, he wanted to build a wall. Uh, he wanted to stop Muslims coming in. You might not agree with those policies, but Actually, I thought he had really recognizable policies. And even if you ask this room before they'd seen your film, give me one Hillary Clinton policy, you wouldn't have been able to name one, or most people wouldn't have been able to name one. So I do think he also cut through with some real policy, even if you don't believe they're the correct policy. No, it's a very good point. And perhaps the way that it should have been phrased was that she had, you know, there's, a, I think, a tendency for policy wants to look at economic solutions yeah. and policies as the real policies. Trump was actually on the campaign trail, if you listen to him, it was, a, you know, it was often an hour meandering, he changed his mind about everything. One day he'd like the British uh, healthcare system, one day he'd, he didn't like it. But he was very consistent yeah. on these cultural, you know, on yeah. issues basically of migration, culture, and race, and religion. So it was the, the, the wall, it was, it was Mexicans, it was Muslims. There he was very consistent. I think that's true, and it's and partly, you know, Hillary Clinton was was not a good candidate. You know, even even she, when she was, uh, you know, touting her book, uh, she came to London, and I did a podcast with her, and asked her. I said, you know, I we were you have you, we're policy wonks at the Economist. We're bigger policy wonks than anybody else. And yet, if you'd asked me at the end of your campaign to summarise what you stood for, I really would have found it hard to do in less than about five minutes of, of reading out right. a list of policies. So she was not a good encapsulator. But I think that's part of a broader problem which is, if you will, the sort of liberal internationalist consensus that I suspect we all and everybody in this room subscribe to, do not actually yet have seriously good answers to the grievances that many of these people had. And Trump, he has the wrong answers, but in the campaign he had simple ones, and he said he was going to make America great again, he was going to bring back jobs. That was what people grappled. I think a lot of people probably discounted the idea of the wall. They thought he'll never actually build it. They probably didn't even necessarily like the extreme racism, but they felt, as you, as it said in your clip, you know, I will bring back jobs, I will make America great again. It was a very clear message to people 
that their life would get better. I also think, don't underestimate the entertainment value. You know, I now edit a newspaper. If we put Donald Trump on the front, well, it's a, like a British newspaper. We put Donald yeah. Trump on the front page of the newspaper, we get a higher pickup of that newspaper that day. You know, they, and he's turning up here and he's... And he'll You're going love... to be in the room, right? He, well, <laughs> I'm going to still be there. But, but he's, you know, he's, he is... Um, you know, he would love to know that that's like what everyone's been talking about for days, him coming. You know, he's, he is, he is I, I think we underestimate that there's just a kind of, in, in, a, in a kind of reality television age, he was the king of reality television. And he, you know, his, his use of the, of the new communication technologies uh, were, was, you know, frankly brilliant. But, you know, I think that's absolutely true. And, you know, maybe we are beginning to see the dawn of a kind of celebrity po politics because I think there's a, there's a wonderful, uh, uh, there's a point in Tony Blair's memoirs where he talks about what Gordon Brown taught him about the, the, the British left. And he said, Gordon taught me everything I needed to understand about Labour Party politics, left-wing politics, because I was a middle-class kid. I didn't come from, really meant, really meant upper middle-class kid. Uh, you know, came, came, didn't come from that world. Uh, but what I taught Gordon is how irrelevant this was to the vast majority of the Br of mm. British people, that most people live a life entirely uninvolved with politics. Their life is, yeah. you know, their, their work, their family, their you know, sports, uh, entertainment. Trump comes out of that much larger world, you know, and politics and pol particularly policy is kind of a ghetto. And I wonder whether this is an invitation for other people, Oprah, you know, the Kardashians to say, hey, you know, we're much, you know, we have met, I, I have 10 times as many Twitter followers than some, some well, senators, you know. It might well be, but I think we would be mistaken if we focus on thinking that this is a shift to celebrity politics primarily, because I think underneath this, these kind of concerns that people have and the dissatisfaction with the status quo, the dissatisfaction of a, an economic system that they think is unfair and is not working for them, that's not going to go away. What we have right now, though, I think on both sides of the Atlantic, interestingly, is actually no sort of new set of policies. If you look at what has happened in mm. America, what Donald Trump has done so far primarily has been essentially a kind of warmed over Reagan agenda yeah. of deregulation and tax cut slash with a bit of reform. And in the UK, well, frankly, nothing very much has happened, but we seem to be having a, a debate, as one Labour MP said to me, about which version of yesterday we want to go back to. Is it you know, the extreme 1970s with Corbyn or the 1950s or possibly the 1850s with various members of <laughs> George's party? Uh, and I think that you know, that's not going to get us anywhere. And the, the, for me, the interesting thing is, when do we start getting serious policy? And policy is well, you're right, South technocratic. But don't we, Zanny, can I ask you a question? Well, don't we have to identify what the problem is? You see, if you're a, cl if you're a yeah. classic, uh, you know, as I was, finance minister, you're going, well, hold on, GDP is growing more strongly than, you know, it has done for a decade in all these countries. Unemployment is lower in Britain, America, and most European countries now than almost has ever been. Okay, let me give you some problems. It, it, real incomes are rising. Actually, inequality is coming down on official Gini coefficient measures and the like. So I think one of the problems that, you know, the sort of collectively the centre has is, you know, tell us what the okay. problem is. All right. Well, the problem is that real incomes in the UK and across the rich world, at the, for, for most people, median real incomes have their biggest hit post-financial crisis mm. than they did in real terms than they did for more than 100 years. They may be now starting to grow again, but after a very big hit that was disproportionately focused on the young, that was disproportionately, you know, the elderly, thanks to mm. generous pensions, were basically exempted from this. There's a sense that, you know, rising inequality is a concern. People think that the fruits of this technological innovation are going to a very small number of people, most of whom are here, that the system is rigged in some way. They may not be right about that, but they feel very, very cross about it. And I think for me, the interesting comparison is actually with the late 19th century, when you had a similar period of technological innovation, you had a similar globalization, you had similar big periods of migration, and you had a backlash in the form of populists in the US and, in, and something somewhat similar in Western Europe. And it was a sort of multi-decade process that brought the progressive era and brought really fundamental social change, whether it was the introduction of social welfare regulation, whether it was the introduction of the income tax, universal secondary education in the US, big, big changes. And for me, the question is, what are the big, big changes we need now and when are we going to get them? But I do think that, it, you know, George is right that it, it's not as clear. But I think you, partly because, you know, The Economist sees the world through this prism, 
uh, are convinced that at core this is an economic issue. If you look at um, Germany, Germany has had the strong, you know, incredibly strong growth for the last 10 years. It has it had no loss of manufacturing jobs. It has had no rise in inequality. The same is true of Sweden. The same is true and of Holland. And in both of those cases, they all have right-wing populist yeah, movements, it, all of which seem to be about immigration absolutely. and culture. And I, I, we started so if you're this not conversation going to address that, yeah, not you, just you, economics. No, but you're viewing the wall as kind of epiphenomenal. What, whereas what Trump says in a, in a post-election um, interview, he said the wall was the single thing that got me through. Every time I would get into trouble, I would talk about the wall, and the crowd would go nuts. I'm not suggesting this is only an economic phenomenon. I, I think we, start, we all agreed at the beginning of this conversation that there was a sense of, um, un, a sort of unhappiness with the pace of cultural and social change and that is driven but in large part by immigration. But is the uncomfortable question, should, you then, should yes, the left a, be moving right on a, culture and immigration rather a, than the right moving left on There's a very good question economics. about what scale of movement of people is compatible with a 21st century welfare state. It's a very interesting and important question. And I wouldn't for a second you know, think we should duck that. Absolutely. And similarly on cultural issues, you know, the kinds of cultural progress that has been made in areas of, of you know, diversity and so forth broadly extremely good from an English liberal perspective, but nonetheless, the whole political correctness debate, frankly, at some point becomes antithetical to free speech, and I think there's a real issue there. So yes, we should have those debates on a social level as well as an economic level, and I don't for a second think it's just economic. But I do think that part of the dissatisfaction of a lot of people, underlying it is a sense of economic unfairness, that this is a system which is not working for them, or working much less well for them than it is for others. But what, uh, the trouble is, what is the system that would deliver for those people? I mean, if you could, you know, well, beyond uh, you know, high GDP growth, low unemployment, uh, you know, considerable income redistribution, actually, in many countries, what, you know, what, uh, the danger is you, you pose a challenge that you don't, you know, it's very well, difficult to find an answer. Now, you can say, well, young people are getting a raw deal, and I would be all for you know, trying to help young people into housing and so on. But it's not actually clear that young people have been the drivers of the populist backlash in Brexit or so Trump or whatever. Give, I mean, so, you know, I mean, I, so I just think there's a danger of sort of misdiagnosing the problem or, or setting yourself up like the system's failing. I mean, I, you know, as someone who didn't want to leave the EU, you know, I think the answer that was provided, which is leaving the EU, is going to make the country poorer than it would otherwise have been. So there's a kind of risk that you end up with solutions that actually make the problem a lot worse. I suspect that this, and I don't think this is the forum to go into a kind of litany of detailed policy proposals, but I think the, the <coughs> magnitude and scale of policy change is much greater probably than you think. Mm -hmm. And so some things to throw out, I think our education system has changed remarkably little in the face of a dramatic technological change. Mm -hmm. So this is a buzzword everyone talks about, but lifetime learning, why should, you know, public involvement mm -hmm. in education stop at the end of universities. Um, trust busting, huge thing that happened at the beginning of the 20th century. Do we need to rethink antitrust mm -hmm. and competition? The American economy is becoming much more concentrated. How do we redesign a tax system for a world that's increasingly driven by, not by sort of industry, but by technology? You know, have we got, is income tax the right way? Are we taxing labor much too much? Should we be thinking about taxing, you know, immobile, taxing wealth, those kinds of things. There are lots of areas where I think we could, can and should have a, just a much broader and more ambitious discussion than one that says, well, GDP is fine. And, I mean, I agree with you. It's great that GDP is growing and it's great that unemployment is low. But those I don't think are sufficient metrics of the health of a 21st century. No, I don't I, I, I don't. I agree with all those, you know, outlines of policies you set out, right? I suspect, you know, the tech world is coming in for heavy government regulation over the next 10 years. Uh, and... Uh, I'm all for you know, doing more for lifelong learning and so on. I just, you know, I wonder if that's really going to the heart of some of the anger and the concern you have out there. It's not that people you know, are, want Google broken up, that they're right, voting right, for right, Brexit right, yeah, or voting right. for Trump, even if it might be a legitimate policy debate. Um, and I think the other thing you have to kind of ask yourself is how you know, how enduring is this challenge? You see, a historian, you, you mentioned the 19th century. A I don't think a historian would have much problem in 100 years' time saying, well, you know, they had a massive financial crash that always creates a political reaction at any point in human history. And you also happen to have a big technological revolution which shook up 
traditional political structures so people could launch political parties off their phone, as essentially Donald Trump did and Emmanuel Macron did. And, uh, you know, but it's essentially the, the world will adjust. Or is this a fundamental crisis of globalization and capitalism? I mean, and I'm not sure we know yet because not. the financial crash was so, such a hit to the economy that it has colored, I think, you know, political decision making right, for a decade. Is Macron going to be the savior? Is well, he the, is he the who centrist? Knows? Who, who knows? But, you know, as you and I have, have discussed this before, I think there are interesting parallels, just to push the historical analogy a bit more, between Macron and Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt, the, you know, one of the main characters in the US progressive era, cloaked a progressive domestic agenda in a kind of uh, national greatness yeah. approach. And he was also very big on symbolism, just as Macron is. And I think that Macron is the first leader who gets the fact that politics is now less about left versus right, but more about, as you said earlier, open versus closed. And I think that sense of remaking society so that it is possible to remain open is something that he certainly understands the challenge. He certainly has the self-confidence uh, that he thinks he'll do it. Whether he will or not, we'll see. But I think he's probably the best hope in Europe for that. I think right now in British politics, at least in serving British politics, there's, I mean, there's nobody with any ideas. The prime minister, when she first became prime minister, you know, gave a speech outside Downing Street that kind of raised some of these issues and talked about correcting the burning injustices. I don't think anything, nothing very much has happened there. I don't think you're going to get George to leap to the defense of no, the Prime I don't Minister. Think so. um, <laughs> what, about e what about Eastern Europe? We, we, the, another puzzle, mm. you know, it seems to me, George, is this is a place where it, it has not gone through the traditional post industrial problems economically. I mean, Poland was growing very well. They barely have any immigrants. Um, you know, in Eastern Europe, I'm struck by, for example, the, the fact that re the resurgence of anti Semitism which is extraordinary given that there are no Jews there. They've managed this, you know, what, what, what is going on? Well, it's, it's, I would say it's in, in broadly in a world where quite a lot of things are going quite well at the moment compared to a few years ago, I would say Eastern Europe is the area where there's a lot of concern because you do see the rise of these uh, nationalist parties and governments that, um, you know, I guess are sort of challenging the European consensus. By the way, I think the result of the, the reaction of the European Union is increasingly just going to be to marginalize them and focus on the Eurozone, particularly now Britain is leaving the EU. Um, well, I mean, it's, I guess the, you know, the, the, the right in Eastern Europe originally was a kind of neoliberal right that emerged out of the fall of the Berlin Wall, right. and they were, they were all kind of supporters of Reagan and Thatcher and you know, in, based in Prague and Warsaw. And it turned out to be a very narrow base to try and construct a right-wing party. Remember, successful right-wing parties, including the British Conservative Party, you know, are not just a kind of pro-capitalist right. party. They will have a kind of cultural dimension and a, and a conservatism to them. Uh, and I don't think, because of the history of those areas, those forces have been allowed to emerge over the 20th century, and they have emerged more recently. I think you also have to accept, um, and you know, I'm someone who's very much in favor of immigration, that you have seen, particularly in Europe, even if not directly into these countries, at least the threat of significant movement of people um, because of uh, you know, what's gone on in the near neighborhood of Europe, like the Syrian civil war. And I think if you're watching television in Warsaw or indeed in London uh, or, and you, or, or indeed Munich and you see you know, just sort of boatloads of young men coming across the Mediterranean, and it's chaotic and obviously tragic often for the people involved, but it just looks out of control and no one's in charge. And, you know, that is an environment in which people who stand up and say, I will put you, you in charge, I can be the strong person, right. they have an appeal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's, I think, one of the things that's gone wrong in the handling of immigration in a European context. And actually, Trump's wall is an echo of that in the United States, which is whether or not you think, you know, bright Indian graduates to go to Silicon Valley, let's at least stop, you know, right. numbers of people we don't even know who they are crossing our border to the south. And, yeah. you know, that, they've sort of latched on to the inability of governments to apparently exercise control on the border. Yeah, Trump would often say, in fact, he would say it in response to the images coming out of Europe, because there actually aren't many images in America. Mexican immigration was down to a trickle. Yeah. But he would look at the European case and say, 
if you can't control your borders, you don't have a country. And it, again, was one of these lines that would resonate very powerfully. Um, let's take a few questions before we, uh, before we close up. Yep, sir. What happens in Europe affects us. What happens in the United States affects us. We have a tendency in the region, as you know, Farid, to blame everything on the outside, and we never blame ourselves because we are perfect and everybody else is not. But having said this, um, during the Cold War, during the time when oil was more important than it is today, there was a lot of interest by foreign powers, the United States and Europeans, in what's happening in the Middle East. Unfortunately, that's not the case anymore. The Middle East has been disintegrating, as we've seen it over the last seven years. Call it the Arab Spring, the Arab Winter, as you wish. But that situation has not ended yet. As a result, you've seen millions of people who have become refugees, displaced, and the story goes on and on, and countries have disappeared from the map. Um, isn't it time for Europe and the United States to look at the Middle East at a time when we see this society being divided, when we see right-wing, whatever you want to call them, populists, nationalists, right-wingers, taking shape, taking hold of power in the United States, in Washington, but also you see in the French elections, we see in Germany, we see in Austria, we see elsewhere, that you, we see Brexit. Uh, all of this trend of moving right-wing is happening at a time when we in the Middle East need foreign positive intervention much more than ever. Maybe a Marshall Plan, maybe some kind of, some kind of humanitarian intervention along liberal old theory. Uh, but if in the absence of this, with what is going on in Europe, we are really doomed. And unless we do something on our, our own, and we are not capable of doing something on our own, unfortunately, then this situation is going to be further exacerbated, and you're going to see millions and millions of boat people in the Mediterranean, I'm afraid, in the years to come. Let's take a few more, and then we'll, we'll come here. Well, um, what, what is the, 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 the role of, of the change in the, the way the information is delivered in all of these we, we are talking? Because, uh, of course, uh, there is no, the, 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 the time where mainstream was uh, made by CNN or or, or, or the economy is, is gone. People receive just yes, the information they want to read. So mainstream is split and atomized. And uh, this uh, brings uh, Iceland's in, in, the, in the population that are very, very committed. Uh, for example, in the case of uh, Trump, uh, 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 people that only read whatever uh, satisfies their egos and desires, and, and this is perhaps 20% uh, of the population, no more, but having 20% very committed is a lot and enough most of the times to, to, to get elections yeah. uh, gone. Uh, let me take one more. Is there, is there, okay, uh, the, the lady there, so we can first achieve a little gender balance. Thank you for the balance. Oops. Um, yeah, I came a little late, so sorry, but I caught an important um, uh, element in the middle, where you're talking, I think, uh, you talked about the left moving right to keep pace, and then the, the, it just got lost in the conversation. I, I, we didn't hear an answer to that, so is there an answer? Sure. Yeah, so or should the right move left? Uh, you know. Right, so then the point I was making was that the, uh, the uncomfortable part that the left doesn't like to talk about is does it need to move right on social and immigration policy? It's more than happy to plunge leftward. Anytime you bring this up in the United States, suddenly the immediate answer of every Democrat is, yes, we need to be more like Bernie Sanders. We need to embrace universal basic income. We need... But the polling shows that the public is already with the Democratic Party on, on most economic issues. The public is basically left of center. Where they disagree with the Democratic Party is on immigration, on transgender bathrooms, unfortunately, on gay rights. I, I agree with you entirely, Zanny. It's, you know, and there I mean, it, it's a, there's a very spirited minority that, dis, that disapproves of a kind of tepid majority support for these things. And that's the conversation that's very hard to have. So when I did an interview with Hillary Clinton, I raised this issue with her, and she absolutely said, no, we will never give back hard, you know, hard fought mm. gains. And I admire that as a, as a, you know, as kind of a matter of moral principle. It does seem to me it has a political effect. Um, let me ask you guys, you can weigh in on this, but also, um, does, does the West have the appetite to do something that Bassam yeah. was describing, go into the Middle East and, and, and reorder it? 
Uh, no, I'll, because uh, we tried that. <laughs> um, well, Britain, I mean, look, I completely agree with the. Well, it worked out well for Jordan. Yeah, they got yeah. a Hashemite uh, monarchy. Yeah, no, yeah. Um, yeah. The days when Britain picked the um, ruling uh, families in the Middle East have long gone. Um, the uh, look, I, I, you know, of course, the Middle East is in an incredible uh, state of flux. I think, to be honest, you know, and I saw this over the years that not just I was a, in government, but I was a member of parliament. You know, I voted for the Iraq War in 2003 as a British MP. You know, there is zero appetite in any Western democracy for large-scale foreign intervention again, you know, certainly uh, until memories fade of the Iraq uh, incursion. Second, uh, I think a lot of us put our hope on the Arab Spring and got excited about Tahrir Square and what was happening in Tunisia and the very early days in Syria. And I think we've all been rather sort of dumbfounded by what has happened and not really clear whether we now support large populist uprisings in previously stable countries, or apparently stable countries. Uh, so we've kind of run out of answers. And into that space has come two things. One is uh, other players, Russia, for example, for the first time since Henry Kissinger kicked them out, is back in the Middle East and looks like a more reliable partner to an authoritarian state that wants to maintain control than perhaps uh, a Western ally. And then second, you're actually seeing a return of actually rather classic Western strongman policy uh, with Donald Trump, for example, supporting the Saudis. And he's not the outlier. He, in many ways, George Bush and Barack Obama were the outliers, and he is returning to a much more classic post-war US policy and other European countries are doing something similar um, because the other approaches of sort of neoconservative intervention and support for Arab Spring populism don't appear to have worked. And of course, you know, there's been uh, a, a large number of people caught up in that tragedy. So, you know, I just don't see the energy or, or willingness to um, get involved, I'm afraid. And I also think there's quite a lot of um, now a kind of feeling in the West that we don't really understand this uh, anymore and we therefore are extremely nervous of stepping into the space of sectarianism and, you know, uh, conflict between Arab states. Zani, um, close this out with some thoughts on the issue of uh, communication. To what extent are these forces of populism uh, strengthened, accelerated by this, you know, this extraordinary narrow casting of media where, as George said, very cheaply, you can create your own channels of communication, you can create your own reality, you can create your own facts? I, I think to some degree that's clearly right. And you know, it's interesting that when the Arab Spring first happened, Twitter and social media was seen as the great force for democracy and everyone was very excited yeah. that this was going to be a way that you know, positive change was coming. Now we're incredibly jaundiced that social media is actually threatening democracy. And I, so I think that's, you're absolutely right. That said, you know, Donald Trump is the creature of TV as much as he is the creature of his Twitter account. And so it, it reminds us that he very brilliantly used TV, which has sort of divided in the US into an extremely polarized television. But I, I think it's worth putting this into context. You know, every time there is a new medium, uh, we think that society has irrevocably been ruined. I think it happened with the printing press, certainly happened with the introduction of sort of mass media at the, end of, the beginning of the 20th century. I suspect over time, as societies, we will adjust to this new media. And we're already seeing it now in the backlash mm. against the social media companies and the way they're being forced to change. So while I think you're right, it's clearly made it worse in the short term, I don't think we can sort of blame everything, and of course I would say this, but we can't blame everything on the media and the way the message is propagated. There are underlying real social, cultural, economic issues that we've talked about, and for while they're still there, and while people are feeling unhappy and dissatisfied, it doesn't matter necessarily which medium it's expressed in, that unhappiness is still going to be there. So it's not a sort of tiny phenomenon that's being magnified by social media. I think it's a very real sense of, of unhappiness with the status quo in lots of countries. I do also think, you know, I, I, some things are just worth fighting for. You know, um, just because, you know, at the moment there's a lot of pushback on some of the social change that's happening doesn't mean we have to kind of give in and follow that. You can, you can fight for yeah. it, and which yeah. Emmanuel Macron has proved is politically possible in France, which is why he's significant. And as for quality journalism, 
Yeah, sure. Everyone two years ago said, well, no one will ever be you know, buying a newspaper or a magazine anymore or you know, watching um, big network television. Well, actually, it feels to me, you would know better than me, but in the US that there's been a resurgence of interest in quality publications uh, like the Washington Post and the New York Times, and there's more people watching uh, I said in the US, I'm coming, I'm coming, don't worry, we're coming on to the uh, economist. Uh, and, you know, and there's a, a huge, you know, you've got more and more people turning into some of the networks like CNN. Uh, and the economist is doing well. And the evening standard circulation is up. And uh, you know, so, I, you know, I just think in the end, it's, it's not, it can't just be about followership. It can't just be like, where's, the, you know, where's the crowd and let's go and chase them. You know, you've also got to have a certain set of values, which I don't think are the wrong values, even if they're derided or regarded as out of touch or whatever. I still think they're the right ones. Go and find a popular way to express them. So I'll, I'll end with, on a hopeful note, uh, the, picking up what, what George said. The one thing that's true in Europe and the United States is that young people are much more comfortable in this open world. They are much more comfortable with social diversity, cultural diversity, sexual diversity. They're much more comfortable with immigration. They're much more comfortable with the idea of a, of a degree of insecurity in the job market, even though obviously they would like more. They understand they don't have one job for life and one pension attached to it. So it feels to me like the, the, you know, the great challenge is to get over this hump um, of a period where you have an older part of the population that understandably is much more resistant to change. Um, and if you could get to that point, then you do need a new politics. I agree with you entirely. But you, you have a population that's much more broadly culturally sympathetic to it. So I guess you know there's light at the end of the tunnel as long as we, the train doesn't blow up on the way to, the, to that. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you.